Let me set the stage, again. SimCity 4 was a game I started playing in 2010, about 7 years after its release. In 2022, it is a game that is almost 20 years old. Name me a game that, even after 7 years of it being around, is still regularly discussed, played, and perhaps even discovered for the first time by many. It isn't a hard question, I could list off numerous Super Nintendo games to qualify for that description. However, the point I'm making is that, for as much as people may still talk about Half-Life 2, I haven't seen a lot of people talk about Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, even though it's sequel is supposed to eventually come out uh, maybe someday. The point is though, some games don't really have a community anymore. Not that they never had one, it's just that people get old, life happens, shit changes. And that's the thing, so much has changed since 2003. We're talking about a world that, while the internet was around, certainly wasn't as prevalent as it is today. The very concept of a content creator wasn't a thing, much less the platform that popularized it. And yet, the SimCity 4 community is a community that has seen what many may consider the old days of the internet just as much as it has the modern times of the internet. That is to say, even relatively speaking, what can be considered old is already not a suitable adjective for SimCity 4. One thought I had in recent memory is what is considered retro, at least with video games. Obviously, anything before the PS1 is retro, but in a way, we're quickly approaching a point where even the PS3 is considered retro. So while some people may be nostalgic for early 2010s YouTube, to really understand the state of the internet when SimCity 4 was released, we need to look at the internet archive. However, what I first want to mention is the benefit of the internet existing. I think in recent times it has been a furious debate whether the internet has been a force of good or evil. I'm being a bit dramatic, but considering the times we live in where the line between the real world and the internet has been erased, much less skewed, it is still important to remember what was only possible thanks to an internet connection. A good starting point is to look at what Simtropolis looked like in 2003. Nowadays, the site is about as modern as any other site. Clearly, if you've been on the internet for long enough, this screams out early to mid-2000s website design. But if you've only discovered the internet after 2010, then welcome to the internet, have a look around an off-green website that mostly shows off game reviews for SimCity 4. Now, I do want to point out this population section. Just under 2,000 people registered at 7.09 a.m. on the 2nd of February 2003. This is interesting to note because just under a year later, the website would be sitting at just under 20,000 registered users. This number number will only go up from here, but the reason I couldn't exactly get a 20,000 registered users screenshot is because from this point onward, there's a few captures showing this donation wall. I guess what happened here was every time you would go to Semtropolis unless you had cookies enabled, you would be asked for a small donation to keep the website running. In terms of crowdfunding, I doubt this is the first time it ever happened on the internet, but considering it does predate a service like Kickstarter by several years, this is an early example of such a phenomenon. It almost isn't weird at all to think about it considering many people on YouTube have Patreons, but at this point you have to think that running what would become the biggest English speaking SimCity 4 fan website wasn't going to come for free. In fact, it is incredible looking at this further. 4 megabits per second bandwidth. That was expensive back in the day. Nowadays, my internet beats that many times over, but either way, this relic of the past was very close to just being a relic of the past. Imagine, if you will, the website that is currently the home of the majority of the SimCity 4 community dying back in 2003 or 2004. To me, this reads as a very fragile website, and is honestly impressive that it has been running for almost 20 years. Simtropolis was never the only SimCity 4 fan website, but it is currently one of the last remaining. Even the official SimCity 4 website is long gone, having been fully discontinued in favor of the SimCity 2013 website. Thus, Simtropolis has become the de facto hub of everything SimCity 4, and perhaps even everything SimCity. Let's be honest, EA really isn't doing shit with SimCity anymore. Unlike with, say, Skylines, where there is at least Steam Workshop integration, SimCity 2013 never officially supported mods. So where are the mods for even that game? Simtropolis. I hope that by now I have emphasized just how important such a site is for the SimCity 4 community, because this will be relevant later on. Though, for now, that is all I will say about Simtropolis. It is still very much an active website, and at least for the foreseeable future will continue to be the first destination for anyone getting into SimCity 4. Simtropolis is a relic of the past that has survived over the ages, however, nowadays it is more likely for a video game to not get a fan website, but instead a fan-made subreddit. Sure enough, our 
slash SimCity4 exists, and this is where the next part of the video begins. Initially, I wanted a short segment in the previous video that looked at the remains of SimCity in a somber way. I figured maybe ending the video with some stories from the community would be a pleasant bow on the nearly complete package. So on May 22nd, 2022, I made a post to both the SimCity and SimCity4 subreddits. Hello r slash simsay4. I am currently working on a video that covers the simsay series. It is supposed to be a very comprehensive video, albeit leaving out smaller games in the series. Why I am reaching out to the community at large is because I want to not only talk about my own view on the series, but also include other people's memories slash interactions with the game series. My goal with this video is to not only capture what I loved about this series, but also capture what others enjoyed too. Thank you for helping me with this video r slash simsay4. Absolute problem. And thus, the open letter was published. Soon I had an inbox with several responses, giving me stories of how some people found the game, how they enjoyed it, and even some unique things regarding the series. I have a distinct memory as a kid of buying the game from Fred Myers. I had that giddy excitement of getting a new game as a kid and being disappointed when I got home and found that my computer couldn't run it. Eventually we got a better computer so I downloaded it off two discs that were needed for it and played for hours even though I had no idea how to actually make stuff work. I remember cousins having Sims 4 and finding it difficult to play. I was maybe 12. I was already a huge fan of The Sims and by now I was either on the expansion where they had a town or I was on The Sims 2. So I was hopeful that with Sims 4 I could imagine my own idea ideal town. Of course, it didn't work that way, but I was immediately drawn in by the transportation options and it still is one of my favorite parts today. Over time, I got the hang of the game and then discovered the mods. I live in Europe, so there was a lot of public transportation options. I used to take home network maps and see how I worked ideas into my city and when I discovered mods, I started downloading real life stations and buildings I visited. Growing up in rural Ireland, we had no public transportation, but SimCity 4 let me escape to my own virtual city. It wasn't until I let go of the expectations of what a city should look like and started playing by the rules of the game and got over my block of bulldozing buildings for network improvements that I developed my best cities. SimCity was really a self-discovery journey. I was a perfectionist in the beginning, but then when I learned to let go that a city doesn't have to be a perfect grid of skyscrapers to look nice, that I really stopped struggling so much. There was also a post discussing the evolution of the SimCity community as a whole, really proposing an idea of how a game could have a community in a pre-internet age. If you want to focus on community, it might be worth it to look at the Super Nintendo version of SimCity because it existed during a unique time in video game history. Every grade school kid in the early 90s knew someone with a Super Nintendo. Before Twitch, before streaming, before forums, before ICQ and AIM, and before game servers like Battle.net made multiplayer computer gaming easy for the average home PC, people gathered at consoles to play together since consoles are built for that express purpose. The video game community in the early 90s was limited mostly to people who actually knew each other through school. SimCity was a different kind of game, one of the few Super Nintendo games that wasn't about defeating the bad guy or solving colorful puzzles. But that didn't stop kids from turning it into a multiplayer experience in the limited ways available to them at the time. Aspiring mayors would zone terrain, provide infrastructure and utilities, build trains and stadiums, and deal with disasters, all while their friends provide suggestions and ate pizza. The community aspect of the game really started to come into its own with the advent and proliferation of web rings in the back half of the 90s. When forms became popularized, people were finally able to exchange ideas and data with each other and have conversations about their cities. These days, organically developed fan sites for games seem to be almost extinct, as places like Steam and Reddit and the Dot Fandom Wiki Network aggregate information about games. The SimCity series has always been about making what you want out of it. For the most part, this has always been a very single player focused game, yet like its sister series, The Sims, there's a lot of interaction between individuals in the community. I think this is what really made SimCity 4 appealing to me. In 2010, I could have easily just stopped playing the game after a few months, but instead I saw what other people were doing. For me, just seeing images of potential city designs, road designs, and the countless mods that aided my quest to build the perfect city is what kept me interested in the game. While I wasn't the only one who liked the game for what road and transportation systems you could deploy into your cities, this is certainly one major aspect of the game, in no small part being the results of the efforts of the network add-on mod team. Though one other aspect I wasn't really aware of is the roleplay aspect of this game. In all honesty, I never considered SimCity 4 as a role-playing game, but one person on Reddit convinced me otherwise. I love kind of role-playing with my cities by imagining changes in government as the years go by and changing the architectural style 
files through the decades, imagining what life would be like for The Sims. I end up doing city censuses every 20 years in game years to find out how many citizens, commercial jobs, industrial jobs, doctors, teachers, even prisoners. I end up with sprawling paint and Excel documents where I put all this information and write the RP story of my cities. Running a census in SimCity 4. Yeah. Alright, this is the type of stuff I like hearing about with games. On one hand, hearing about the inner workings of a game's code and how a particular glitch can be a legitimate speedrun tactic is cool. And on the other hand, taking a game and extrapolating from it is even cooler. And in reality, this is an aspect I've only partially touched on with SimCity 4. While taking a census of your city is definitely a unique thing to do, one part of the community I have neglected to look at is regions and city journals. Some of my favorite memories of SC4 were the huge regions people modded, specifically Dob Driver whose maps are the best. No other city builder operates on the scale of SimCity 4, and my favorite thing to do is take a massive region and build a whole country into it with multiple cities and farmlands and wilderness. It doesn't seem like any other city builder will match the immense scale that a modded SimCity 4 save can attain. I also really like city journals, some of my absolute favorites were CSG Design's natural growth, which heavily influenced my own playstyle, as well as many others. Indoor by Antimony Cats is one of the best world building journals in my opinion. They really made the world feel real and the city itself was beautiful. Castiana by Ion 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 is similarly incredible in terms of its beauty and scope. I will be elaborating on this further later on, but this is another section of Simtropolis that deserves a mention. Oftentimes, I've only ever used Simtropolis for the Stex file exchange to get new mods for the game. However, a good part of the community does revolve around city journals and simply showing off your cities. This is in part why SimC4 does translate very well over to YouTube. However, on the front page of Simtropolis, the city journals are on full display. And now, that brings us to Discord. From my open letter to the SimCity 4 community, I was contacted by two members of the NAM team, Durf Cern and Hal Jackie. They expressed interest in helping me with my video, and with their help, so did several other members of the NAM team. So, I was invited to a Discord server where the NAM team and I began talking. Essentially, they answered many of the questions I had, conveniently in a document, over the span of about a week or two. Before moving any further, I really do need to give a special thanks to everyone at the Network Add-on Mod team. They Thanks to their help, I am able to create this video that documents much of the 20 years of the SimC4 community. I do want to make it clear, however, that obviously everything I'm about to report isn't 100% reflective on the whole community, but does at least give a pretty good insight into the community. Team. Many members have been part of the community for years, some young, some old. I'm happy that they have gone through the efforts of talking about their experiences with the game, as I feel this greatly helps to preserve the story of the community in a much more easily digestible format. So thank you, Network Adam Mod Team, for your help in making this video, and now let me tell you the story of SimCity 4. In terms of the English-speaking community, Simtropolis is definitely the center of it. Even today, you can see aspects of SimCity 4's past and really SimCity as a series. Scroll to the bottom of the page, and you can find resources for SimCity 2000, SimCity 3000, SimCity 4, and two former sites named sc3000.com and scforever.com, the latter two having shut down a couple of years ago. On the stacks, there's sections for SimCity 4 buildings, the old Simpeg Plex, SimCity Brazil, SimCity Polska, Walking Man Productions, another SimCity 4 site from back in the day, and other games like Say Skylines, SimCity 2013, SimCity 3000 again, and Say's XL. As already explained, the website has only grown to take on this identity in the community. Back in 2003, it wasn't nearly as comprehensive. It would be around this time that the stories of some of the NAM team members begin. Hal Jackie wrote about having grown up with SimCity and the Super Nintendo, getting SimCity 2000 on the computer, eventually getting SimCity 3000, and then buying SimCity 4 on launch day. Once I understood the game well and more or less maximized my enjoyment of SimCity 4, I did some Google searches to see what others had built, and that led me to Simtropolis slash the SimCity 4 online community. By 2006, I became an active member, and by 2007, I became a very well-known slash established member. Like Hal Jackie, Eggman121, one one, one of the NAM developers, found the community from a Google search. I started playing in 2005, and the instant I loaded it up, I then closed it. I typed in the browser mods for SimCity 4. One of the first items I downloaded, a custom sign pack for GMAX, was of interest for me, but then I found the network add-on mod. I posted some images of interchanges that I had made and got rave reviews about the ingenuity of the designs. Some of the comments came from colleagues I have worked with now in the NAM development as a NAM team member. In addition, the current lead of the NAM team, Tarkus, would also start getting involved in the community. I first started 
start lurking the latter parts of 2005, officially joining Simtropolis in February 2006 and in 2007 joined SC4 Devotion, Simpeg, and a few other sites. I ended up making my primary home at SC4 Devotion, became an administrator there in June 2008, eventually assuming ownership of the site three years ago. 2005, and the game is now two years old, and yet it seemingly has a very active community. I find this particularly fascinating because there's been a few games in recent years, from big developers even, that have lost a lot of their player base before the year is up. Artifact. Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck, I forgot this existed. Artifact. Okay, just look at the chart. Alright, here's a less dramatic one. In the six months from each game's respective launch, Battlefield 2042 has fewer concurrent players compared to its all-time high relative to Elden Ring. Let me correct myself real quick. Elden Ring came out in mid-February, meaning even at this moment, it has only been out for just over four months. For some reason, Steam Chart shows player data for Elden Ring in January 2022. I'm not too sure how, even if the game was originally meant to be released then, but that is a mistake on my part. In addition, I should note that even with this mistake, my point still stands. At this moment, it appears to me Elden Ring's average player count has stabilized around the 50,000 mark, and I cannot see it having any drop-offs between now and the next few months. As for Battlefield 2042, there was a player spike over the duration of June 2022. This is because they finally launched their first season pass after several months of the game being out. In addition, at this very moment, the Steam Summer Sale is currently ongoing and the game is half off. Just to shove another knife into Battlefield 2042, you can tell EA is desperate for people to buy it since it is half off. Meanwhile, Elden Ring still has its full $60 price tag a mostly single-player game. So, the game historically designed for a bunch of people to be playing it at the same time has continued to be surpassed by a single-player game. Never mind that in order of magnitude more people are playing Elden Ring than Battlefield 2042, but just looking at this drop-off, this is pretty absurd. I mean, at this moment, there's more people playing Apex Legends than Battlefield 2042 if you want a fair metric. Now, this could always change, but my point is that Battlefield 2042 is a recent example of a game quickly, no, rapidly, losing its community. Of course, nowadays, the community around Sims 4 is microscopic compared to any of these games. But hey, at least Sims 4 has a more active player base than Artifact. Back to Sims 4, let's move forward to 2008. I discovered Sims 4 around early 2010. I told that story in the previous video. However, it was to my surprise that a few members on the NAM team also discovered the game around this time. Durf Cern told me about discovering the game around 2008 in primary school. Long before I found the modding scene, I would spend hours playing, usually trying to get a massive amount of traffic bottlenecked on a stretch of highway just to see if the computers could handle it. Meanwhile, Lucario Bariqua wrote about joining during a similar time. My start with SimC4 is comparatively recent when compared to most of the NAM membership or most other notable community members. I started with the game in late 2009 and joined Simtropolis by March 2010, with zero prior experience with SimC4's predecessors. I'll say right now, I do not know any of the exact ages of the members of the NAM team, so as a result of that, I was quite surprised to discover some people who I would assume are closer to my age than I expected. I always thought I was the weird one for being into such an old game, but clearly I wasn't the only one. While I highly doubt so many children are discovering Sims 4 now, I think this revelation does highlight a multi-generational interest in Sims 4. With that said, given how old the game is, it is to be expected that many people have moved on from the community. One specific year I was seeing thrown around as the peak of SimC4 was 2008, five years after its launch. One thing that is evidence of this is the phenomenon Tarkus calls content development teams. He explained that these teams were typically groups brought together under an acronym or a single brand that released content for the game. NAM is actually one of those, even to this day still having many people working on it. On screen are a few other acronyms Tarkus listed off, but these are names you'll often see around the SimC4 community. But by about 2012 or so, especially after the BSC's massive off-site private board crash, Crashed, the indie model started to take off more, and most of the teams either disappeared or became mere shells of themselves. At this point, a majority of content that I see on Simtropolis appears to be coming from individuals. While the indie model, as Tarkus puts it, didn't originate in 2012, as there were several independent creators before that, it is fairly natural for nowadays to have a greater focus on individual creators as the community has slowly gotten smaller. However, despite getting smaller, it is possible that the community is growing again. One particular thing that some members echoed is the community is currently in a new wave of interest. Durf Cern talked about how there's new talent and returning talent to community in recent years, with Simtropolis and SC4 Devotion being more active in recent years. The main sites, while never dying, have been notably more active in the COVID and post-COVID world. 
draw what conclusions you want from that timing. Bippin, another developer on the team, writes, You can't contrive a community like the one we have with SimSafe 4. I think a lot of people sought that elsewhere, realized it wasn't going to happen, and came back to SimSafe 4. The recent pandemic has given people additional time to spend on their own and re-explore what once was, and transform it into what will be again. The resurgence of old members returning to SimSafe 4 communities like Simtropolis and SimSafe 4 Devotion, and the NAM team bringing on board new blood and old certainly speaks to that. And while Bippin was talking more from the angle of the community's reaction, Action to City Skylines, I personally began reevaluating what I wanted to do with this channel at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, I do feel inclined to believe that the events of the COVID-19 pandemic at minimum gave some time for pause and possibly led some people to return to a game they've been nostalgic for. Of course, this still expands to many things, but I do not doubt some people returned to this game during the COVID-19 pandemic, reinvigorating the community alongside it. As mentioned previously, there's also been several instances of things disappearing given enough time. Simtropolis currently holds a repositories of several dead SimSafe 4 fan sites, but that doesn't mean Simtropolis has been immune to failure, nor SimSafe 4 devotion as well. With that said, I do not bring this up to throw shade on any of these two sites, but more so out of concern for the longevity of the community. A particular question I asked the whole team was that of archival and preservation. I had several different interesting responses. On the topic of archiving mods and custom buildings in the community, I have already spoken about dead sites having their content re-uploaded onto Semtropolis. However, as it turns out, this may only be part of a much larger conversation. Hal Jackie writes, One aspect I've always been uneasy with was the pretty tight redistribution of custom content. I've risked my reputation in the community to get that change. That's one of the few major topics that still divides the community, and I've put my full support behind doing anything and everything to make it easier for new players to get as much custom content as quickly and free as possible. If Semtropolis were to go for whatever reason, yes, I agree, that would be an unrecoverable blow to the community. In addition, talk is added. I've also in some cases simply re-hosted some files at SC4D after attempting a good faith effort to contact the original creator. Doing something like that was taking a bit of a risk, especially given how the community has generally abided by fairly strict policies that have generally frowned upon redistribution. But it feels like it was a necessary step in this era of the community when there's so many creators who haven't been active for 15 plus years, or in some cases are deceased. The reception to doing so has generally been positive, particularly as we've taken care to only do it in last resort situations. Additionally, if we as the staff of the major sites don't take these steps, the CD underbelly will sloppily do the job for us, and given what EA and Will Wright himself think of that crowd, that'd really be the end of the legitimate SimSafe 4 community. I've thought about Tarkus' statement for a while now, as in my eyes, I don't particularly care who it is that does the archival effort so long as it is done well. It reminds me of a combination of how old video games have been saved and redistributed along with a commonly held opinion on the success of Valve's Steam. Part of why Steam has been so successful is how easy it is to just get a game off of it, and even with Steam's DRM, it generally isn't invasive. It's why things like Spotify and Apple Music have prevailed over piracy sites, or why people will just look to YouTube to find music. However, I do think Tarkus is right in his assessment of the situation. Someone will most likely archive this stuff some way or another. Hypothetically, it could just be me uploading my plugins folder, but that would be sloppy. Instead, I do appreciate how Tarkus recognized that he is in charge of SC4 Devotion. He has the power to preserve stuff much easier and much better than almost anyone else could. He writes, I'll note SC4 Devotion was itself on the brink of shutting down before I assumed ownership of it in 2019, so I've had discussions with many of the past stakeholders about a course of action if the worst happened, and personally undertook steps to preserve files and key form threads. I actually have the entire to the lex on my hard drive, PDFs of many projects' private development threads, including over a decade of NAM threads, and had the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine crawl many of the major public threads. The moment I read that, I had to take a moment to appreciate this dedication to preserve preserving the community. Part of why I wanted to not only make the previous video but also this video is because I felt like time was slowly running out to effectively talk about the SimSafe 4 community. In a way, that could have run out in 2019, back when I was making some of the early videos on this channel. But fortunately, it seems like such a clock has yet to run out for the SimSafe 4 community. If anything, it might be that time is being added to the clock. One very interesting thing I came to learn more about with this game's community is the existence of city journals. I've seen some of these on the front page of Simtropolis over the years, but never really paid them much attention. Turns out I should have. Ulysses, one of the developers on the team, clued me in on a few city journals. For instance, Ulysses' own Federal Republic of Seculia follows a fictitious nation with a very Mediterranean look to it. In fact, this city journal had a link to, get this, 
a fictional Wikipedia article that actually had me look at Google Maps just to remind myself there in fact isn't a little New Zealand off the coast of Brazil. Oh, but it gets better because this article outlines an entire history of this country that doesn't exist. But trust me, it still hasn't gotten better because this is all part of a collective of players called the Alliance of Independent Nations, which is comprised of a bunch of countries that do not exist. And hold up, there's the United States, but in an alternate timeline where this is the flag. This has to be blasphemy. But apparently this version of the United States had a revolution that ended in 1778 at the Baltimore Peace Conference, but not before France just gave all of its North American territory to the British colonies in what I assume is an alternate version of the North American theater in the Seven Years' War. Alright, alternate history America and SimCity takes the cake. Then there's Ionica by Militant Radical that takes inspiration from the city of Hong Kong and the anime films Ghost in the Shell, Akira, and Metropolis 2001. While I haven't read through every single one of these entries, I do have to say that what I have seen is incredible. I've wanted to make cities this detailed in city skylines, and while I know that this is possible, it is crazy to realize this is still in the same game I grew up playing. And now if we return to Andorra for a moment, which was briefly mentioned earlier, you can witness the opposite of Ionica. Now if it wasn't for Photo Bucket being the reason Imgur exists, you can clearly see the old European feeling that Andorra captures. I mentioned this at the end of the last video, but the look of a city is very important at the end of the day. Some c 4s default buildings do look very American and certainly lack any popular architectural styles after 2003. This is where modding does come in, and I think this is best seen in both Ionica and Endora. At the end of the day, there are a multitude of city journals, and I want to end the video off on that note. There is a lot that could be talked about with SimCity 4 and its community. There is a lot of detail that I haven't covered simply for the fact that I am trying to show so much in a single video. But I want to return to the idea of role-playing in SimCity 4 and really any city builder game. I've made comparisons to Minecraft during these two videos, and for good reason. Ultimately, while people do find different things to like in Minecraft on a per-person basis, it is the stories of things that happen in the game that I remember most. Likewise, even if building a city is fairly lonely, there is a community of city planners who come together on one thing, building their cities. In essence, this game is about building a world, a digital world that doesn't exist, that expresses a keen interest on the aesthetics of a society. One could take the world building made by one of these city journal creators to actually make a tabletop RPG campaign. One could take the Alliance of Independent Nations project and potentially make a political drama out of it. Hell, with Ionica, seeing everything here makes me think of moments from Ghost in the Shell or Cowboy Bebop, while Endora makes me think of the works of Dickens, specifically Victorian London. I could be off on any of these assessments, but this is all stuff that is possible and has been done in SimCity 4. It is my hope that for as long as the city builder genre exists, not only is SimCity 4 never forgotten for being the greatest Sim City, but that it continues to be supported by its community. This isn't a game by Electronic Arts limited by profitability, it is a game by the community limited by imagination. The final thought I want to give is in the spirit of what I ultimately want to achieve with this video. I expressed great concern over the future of the community and the security of it when interviewing the NAM team. It is my pleasure to say that discussions around archival and preservation have already been happening in the community. Continued efforts have been made to ensure the longevity of nearly 20 years of community-generated content. With this video, I want to bring what may be hidden among 20 years of forum posts to the front of attention. No one is going to dig through the entire catalog of the entire website's forums much less two websites just to get this information. Instead, I feel that it would be more successful to make a video as, in my eyes, videos are infinitely more accessible than thousands of forum posts.